Prof, really appreciate you carving out some time today. Hey, thanks for having me on the show, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Listen, I got a, a laundry list of questions here to tee up here today for you, but I'd love to start on the longevity side. Um, okay. Obviously, you've heard a lot about longevity and, and protein intake being obviously your expertise. And I feel a lot of questions from clients around, you know, what they hear that increasing protein intake can have adverse effects on longevity. We see some of the work mm -hmm. from Walter Longo and colleagues uh, and animal models and some observational work. Do you maybe describe to folks what the rationale would be for kind of lowering protein from those camps and what the strength of that evidence is at this point? The theory, or so it goes anyway, is that um, if you ingest protein, there's an association with uh, rises in a hormone called insulin-like growth factor one. And uh, IGF-1 is a pro-growth factor, and it's associated sort of, you know, uh, I'll, I'll call it a cousin, which is growth hormone as well, um, are these pro-growth factors. And, and the, the theory is, at least, is that chronically increased levels of these hormones could drive cellular growth in, um, you know, cellular growth, you think, well, it's not too bad, but uncontrolled cellular growth is, is cancer, right? And so Walter Longo and several others would sort of point to uh, their very well done, like the science is immaculate, I can't touch it, but it's in some really interesting models. And I would say sort of mouse models and a few other things that uh, shows that uh, these mice on higher protein diets do have increased rates of cancer. And then, so they don't live as long. And then you get some of the human observational data. And here's where, you know, to me, if you do a really deep look into the human data, it's actually fairly varied. And so I don't know that there's a consistent pattern associating higher protein intakes with shorter lifespan then it gets really gray and you have to, I think, take a little bit of a leap of faith to say that it's an applicable uh, hypothesis to human beings. Yeah. I mean, it seems interesting on the sort of practical front when we look at obviously some of your work and Theo Spoglu and this idea that, you know, the current RDA for protein only being 0 0.8 grams per kilo, as we look towards longevity, we're seeing benefits towards that 1.2 grams per kilogram. And and maintaining muscle mass and supporting longevity. And so those two things obviously seem to be at odds in the sense of if we're going to increase protein intake to protect muscle and, and bone, then, and that's going to support longevity, then, you know, making sense of those two directions, could you shed some light on, uh, you know, that, that suggestion around increasing to that 1.2 and some of the work you've done there? Yeah. I mean, I, I think one of the, the, you know, the practical sort of take home messages around, you know, it's not just our work. And I mean, it's lots of people in the sort of protein field who would argue mm -hmm. that particularly as you get older and even the Longo data supports this is that your requirements for protein actually go up. So there's this condition that we call anabolic resistance that sets in as you get a little bit older, where you don't get the same anabolic effect with uh, protein ingestion that you did when you were younger. Mm -hmm. um, lots of reasons why that's the case, but that may be one of the key reasons why you need a little bit more protein. So the system gets a little bit less sensitive and you need a, a greater stimulus, so more protein. And as you point out, that's associated with uh, greater muscle mass, it's associated with improved muscle function, uh, activities of daily living are even improved in those situations. You get less fractures, lots of other things that sort of you know are contrary to the idea that lower protein would allow you to, to live longer. And, you know, my, my, my take on a, a lot of the animal models, which, you know, it's very elegant science and it's very mechanistically revealing is that these animals are, are what we call inbred uh, as opposed to humans who are outbred, like we're, yeah. you know, <laughs> so we're a little different. Yeah. And we're not kept in sort of a very sealed, contained, you know, pathogen and 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 now virus, right? You know, so stress-free, I guess. <laughs> yeah, stress-free. And I think that you know these sort of stressful periods of disease or or like disuse, hospitalization, are are just not things that are experienced by these animals in cages. And so that's to me at least where there's a big dissociation between the animal models and the human condition. And so. You think about those stress points and, and for an older person, th those are true watershed moments. They can lose a lot of muscle. They go downhill really quickly and they don't get it back. And so, you know, our theory at least is that these, these disuse events, these disease events, et cetera, 
are uh, critical points in an older person's life. And, you know, the mice in a cage just, just don't have anything like that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that I experienced firsthand. I and mean, my dad, when he was in his mid-70s, he went out west to visit my sister and caught a bad cold. And then all of a sudden, he's coming back off the plane in a wheelchair. He looks like he's lost 10 or 12 pounds. And he's spending a week in the emergency room. And they can't figure out how to keep his electrolytes on point. Yep. And so that sort of starting of that sarcopenia that was really became accelerated and and was not in a good way for a period of time. And, yeah. and the challenge at that age, especially with the clients I see is around, they need a greater dose as you're suggesting there, but then the appetite's lower. And mm. so, you know, so what are some of the strategies there? Is this where, you know, using some portable nutrition or some supplements could be helpful or how can we get some of these boluses that, you know, 65, 70 plus are going to need to be able to stimulate? Yeah, great point. Yeah, you know, the scenario you painted with you, with your dad is, is not uncommon. And, you know, I saw it in, in, in my dad as well particularly, you know, as he sort of went downhill with chronic heart failure that he did less and then he did less and, and you know, and, and it yeah, just becomes just a big spiral. Downward spiral, yeah. Exactly. So the the point seems to be, as you say, is that, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to preach, get more protein, eat more, and yet your appetite is down. So, you know, how do we counteract this? And so we begin to hone in on some of the sort of key ingredients and, the, and you know, a key amino acid uh, is leucine. So out of all the 20 amino acids to so the building blocks of protein, this one amino acid is sort of the trigger amino acid. In other words, it it really switches on muscle protein synthesis. And so we've tried enriching lower doses of protein with leucine to see if we could uh, trigger a greater anabolic response. And indeed, we, we, we do see that. And that's led to a couple of uh, innovations in sort of, you know, some patents around leucine enriched protein bars, leucine enriched, uh, ready to drinks and that sort of thing. So, you know, and there are several companies out there that are pursuing similar things. So the Nestle's and Danone's of the world have um, supplements that are, that are simply, you know, a little bit higher in some of these uh, amino acids and leucine in particular. So, yeah, I do think that there's there's room for that. You know, food first, obviously, if you can do it. Uh, but if the volume of food is, is tough, um, then I, I think supplements are a good alternative for older people. Yeah, it's interesting. If you don't work with that population, you sort of don't realize that even dentition plays a role of just being able oh, yeah. to select a protein source that they can actually yeah. chew and it is comfortable with. And, you know, so for me as a practitioner, trying to establish some of these habits when we're 30, 40, 50, in terms of ensuring protein intake helps a lot so that by the time we're 60, 70, 80, it just becomes second nature and it's just how you eat. Yeah. Um, you know, you recently completed a systematic review and meta-analysis around supporting muscle mass and function in, in healthy adults. Often think about these different points. Again, it's kind of 1.2 and I, you know, I had Rob Morton on a couple of years back around the 1.6 gram, grams per kilo. Yeah. You know, is, is that more of the sweet spot when we're looking to kind of make further progress on the, on the muscle mass front? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, just to be really clear, the writer's statement is that the recommended dietary allowance um, sits at 0.8 grams of protein per kilo per day. And, 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 you know, it was, it's a semantic argument, but I would actually be, I don't think that's going to change, but I, it, its name needs to change. So it needs to be called the MDI, which is the minimal dietary intake in, in my yeah. estimation. So first it's not recommended and it's, <laughs> yeah. you could, you're allowed Survival. to have more. So when you say it's the recommended dietary allowance, I'm like, you know, that's, it's just the wrong name, but it's, yeah. it's never going to change. Like I've been doing this for 20 plus years and I don't see any, any signs that it's going to change. So if, if we just renamed it and, and then I, I actually, that's, that's great. Uh, so let's, let's work from there, which is yeah. sort of the bottom line and go upwards. And so, yeah, I think, uh, you know, the closer you can get older people on a daily basis to about 1.2, uh, I think things are, you know, going to work out a little bit better when you're in sort of these stress states. And that's sort of what athletics is, you know, uh, people who are training heavy or, that's a state of constant stress and, and it's the repair of the stress and the recovery where obviously the gains are made. And then I think there's reason to go up as high as 1.6. So that, you know, that's, that's twice the recommended dietary allowance. And yeah, I know a lot of people go, Oh, you know, I have athletes consuming more than that. And my, my point is 
you know, for sure, you know, you, there are people on two and three and sometimes four times that sort of intake. And, you know, it's not that you can't eat it and it's not that your body won't even digest it. It's that your body can't actually use it. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's my point. Yeah. Put it in the machine. No problem, but it's what the machine does with it. And, <laughs> and it tends to soften out and plateau around 1.6. So, you know, I'm not going to, disagree with people who want to uh, get the last little drop out of the, you know, the cloth when they squeeze it, that's fine. But I think that um, a good amount of water is already out of the cloth at 1.6. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, on that athlete side of things, obviously everyone's looking for those marginal gains and trying to yeah. account for everything. So as they move up towards that heuristic, which is the 2.2 grams per kilo or the gram per pound, yeah. which you often hear, I mean, between yeah. the 1.6 and 2.2, it sounds like what you're saying is we're really towards the top of that bell curve. And it's really pretty marginal if anything's there at all yeah well and this is the thing and 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 you know i don't, I don't want to you know get into uh, a debate over you know this is the reason why i win or this is the mm. reason i win in spite of what i do but i mean i i do think uh, the analogy that i give the athletes and tends to work you say you know you dip a cloth in water and you're squeezing it and those first few turns man a ton of water comes out and so that's yeah. really like you get your training dialed in you get your sleep dialed in you get you know, most of your nutrition dialed in or whatever. And then the last little part, you got to work really hard to get some water out of that cloth. And that's sort of the, you know, that's the margin or the zone that I suppose a lot of the elites are playing in. And so there may be the beyond 1.6 and then, you know, plus, plus, plus with lots of other uh, sort of more, I'll call them bespoke uh, nutritional practices that, you know, mere mortals, uh, and I'm squarely in that club, um, really don't need to uh, to do. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm 1.6. That's good. 2.2. If you're, you know, you're really worried about uh, the last little bit, I do tend to chuckle when you get some folks who say, well, I'm at 2.2 and I take branch chain amino acid supplements and I you know, do this and this. And I'm like, well, you know, uh, I saw a great meme on Instagram the other day and it was, you know, there's a guy in a swimming pool, it's raining and he's drinking some water. Right. So yeah, I, I'm like, like, well, it's, you're surrounded by water, you know, it's like, what, what, what more can you do? But, uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit more practical now than I was, you know, even five years ago and definitely than 10 years ago when I was convinced that, you know, this, uh, this really made a difference. But, I mean, it's interesting with at the higher level with athletes because it tends to get in the way of other things, especially when we look at sports like basketball, where we're trying to fuel to a certain degree. It's it's difficult then to achieve some of the carbohydrate totals that we're after because everyone's filled up on protein. And, and it's nice to see the messaging has got there because I know 20 years ago, professional soccer players and basketball, it was they weren't hitting those numbers, but now they really seem to be. Um, yeah, that's an interesting comment. Actually, you're, you're, you're not the first person to say that to me. And, and, you know, the pendulum swings around, right? So if you went to any sports med, sports med or sport nutrition conference 20 years ago, when I was sort of first getting into this, all you heard about was carbohydrates and, you know, fat, just dab wasn't a deal or whatever. And protein was really relegated to like, you know, it's, everybody's getting enough, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, you swing back a little bit and now protein has enjoyed its, uh, its time in the sun. Uh, but as you say, it's, uh, maybe at the detriment of getting people's carbohydrate intakes up to the levels where you need them. And, and, you know, I don't think that there's, although some people would de- uh, disagree with the, you know, given the keto lifestyles that have c- cropped up, Yeah. Uh, but I don't think there's any denying that the sort of critical performance zone for the high-end folks it's it's all fueled by carbohydrates but you're not the first person especially even at the elite levels to say you know, the obsession around protein and getting enough has uh displaced the the carbohydrate that some of these folks need and and that's an important message actually yeah i mean it's amazing just the energy expenditure and especially a sport like basketball so it's it's tricky to get enough fuel in and you know, if we circle back to the conversation around longevity, the other aspect that gets a lot of attention, obviously, is just energy intake, as we're talking about. So getting into some of these deficits for around supporting longevity. Sure. I think it was uh, so Jack Dorsey, the Twitter CEO, is only consuming a yeah. meal a day. And when we think about our discussion about protein, all of a sudden we're consuming one sure. meal a day. It gets pretty darn tough to hit your daily total, let alone kind of divide it through any type of timing through the day. But if we talk about energy... You know, what's the research telling us there in terms of 
longevity. I mean, obviously two thirds of the population are overweight or obese. So an energy yeah. deficit would seem to be a good idea, but is, is that more of a, an area to, to look to versus the strictly the protein that we talked about previously? All right. Well, uh, so let me say this is that again, so, uh, you know, there's, there's multiple combinations. I mean, originally it was just st- straight flat out, you know, energy restriction, calorie restriction, mm-hmm. and then it sort of moved into, then you got, uh, you know, intermittent fasting, and then you went through that to people are time restricted feeding. And then now there's even sort of this, uh, you know, more prolonged fasting periods and there are apps to sort of, you know, signal to you what, what, what's happening in your body. And everybody seems to have learned the word or autophagy, <laughs> um, although I'm not sure that anybody really knows what it means. But I see it more of the so, scrabble so, boards than I ever have. Yeah, yeah. It's like autophagy and or, you know, autophagy or, yeah. you know, everybody's got a pronunciation for it. So my sort of practical take on that is, is that um, animal models, again, so rats, mice, everything else like that, when you calorically restrict, so forget about intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding for now, uh, they live longer. And again, is, is that a real effect or is it an effect of, you know, the usual sort of cage-fed, uh, what we call uh, chow-fed animals are actually being overfed. And so now we're sort of getting them back to you know, what they are supposed to be eating given their activity level and, you know, mice and uh, they, they, and rats, they, they run forever if you put a running wheel in their cage. Um, and I think the situation is maybe similar in, in, in humans is that we, you know, if we sort of energy restrict to the point that we keep ourselves lean, then that's the effect that you, you would sort of expect. And the crash course really comes when you you know you move up the hierarchy of animals that have that, that they've done these energy restriction experiments with and when you get to primates and they've done it in in, in primates so sort of our closest relative yeah uh, there are two studies and one found it was beneficial and, and one didn't uh you know and it's interesting they're in two different locations in the united states and so if you're if you were a primate or one of these monkeys in Wisconsin, you live longer. And if you're a monkey down in, I think it was near Washington D.C., you didn't. And so the question was, you know, is what what, what happened? Is it really still applicable? Um, and uh, you know, the answer gets a little a little cloudier again. So while I don't disagree with you know, obviously maintaining a leanness and in, in as in as much as, you know, caloric restriction of any kind um, is going to result in that sort of body type, hopefully, which is probably a good thing. Um, I'm still a little bit suspicious that it's going to increase your lifespan. And one of my, it, it's trite, I know, and I'm probably poking fun is uh, I, I can't think of too many people that are like, I'm not interested in living to be 120 and feeling like I'm 120. Like exactly, I just, yeah. it so it's really span, about, really. it's health span, right? It's not like, you know, the hope is that you so-called compress morbidity. In other words, you know, you're cruising until you're whatever you are, 105, and then you go to sleep and you, and you never wake up. Yeah. You know? So there's no sickness that demarks the end of uh, it, the end of your life or you know, worse yet for the last sort of 10 or 15 years of your life, you have chronic diseases that really lower your quality of life. And and that's what we're really trying to avoid. So I still say, well, you know, if you can be as physically active as as you can, exercise is the forgiver of a lot of sins. So, uh, you know, calorically restricted mice and everything else, they're aggressive. Uh, They they seem miserable. (laughs) Um, (laughs) They have no interest in reproduction. Uh, uh, like, which is their normal urge. So all of those things make me think, you know, maybe this isn't the right way to live, but you know, everybody's got to have a stick. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it obviously seems like the steeper, the caloric deficit, then all of a sudden we're going to be burning off muscle mass. And of course that takes a long time to put back yeah. on. And so, you know, we're, it's really putting the cart before the horse and you talked about exercise. I mean, that's a common theme movement exercise amongst all the populations that tend to live the longest. Um, yeah. Most of it's just baked into how they live and they don't probably even think of it as exercise. It's just what they do on a daily basis. Absolutely. Yeah. When we look at some of the research around grip strength or leg strength or, or VO2 max, can you speak to some of those markers that, you know, we, we can somewhat hang our hats on and say, Hey, these are some pretty good yeah. targets. So can we, you know, keep our capacities up in these areas? Sure. 
Uh, so grip strength, we'll talk about that one first, only because it's used so often and, and everybody sort of goes grip strength. So the practicality is, is that there's no standard strength test that, you know, everybody around the world uh, do, can do or does uh, that's as easy and convenient as grip strength. So everybody, you know, yeah, lots office, of people. Right? Yeah, exactly. So you've got a hand dynamometer in a doctor's office and it, and it is you know, my take is on an individual level, it might not be overly prognostic for future issues, but on a group or slash population level, it's one of these, you know, incredibly predictive, um, you know, biomarkers that we have. Uh, VO2 max, the same thing. Now, your aerobic capacity, you know, if you can keep that up, uh, then again, you, you're looking good. Uh, my, my take as to why those things are so pr- predictive of future problems is that they're physiological tests that cross multiple organ systems. So it starts in your brain. Mm -hmm. uh, And then you have to have efficient transmission of a neural signal down nerves to talk to a muscle, to make it contract. And, you know, you think VO2 max, you've got to have your heart and your lungs in working order. So, you know, tests that do that, if there's a weak point anywhere in the chain there, then the performance goes down. And, you know, so my sort of take is, is that anything that we can do to kind of keep those, uh, those chains in, in good working order. So yeah, stay aerobically fit, be strong. Although, you know, so grip strength is a proxy marker for strength elsewhere. Yeah. Um, then, you know, it's, it's, it's going to turn out in your favor. And I mean, you, you can't have a good VO2 max with a failing heart. You can't have a good VO2 max with, you know, chronic lung disease and you can't have a good VO2 max if you've got poor muscle quality and you can't be strong unless you have good muscle mass. So they're proxy markers for all the things that exercise props up um, and, you know, hopefully in the end uh, allows you to, you know, dodge and weave through all of these potential chronic diseases that, uh, that are out there. Yeah. It's an interesting time as we sort of, the groups are sort of moving in different directions that we've got one group in society that are really getting into their exercise and fitness and, and instruction is really good and people are getting fitter and stronger than we've seen in maybe ever and unfo- yeah. unfortunately maybe a quite a bigger swath that are getting you know movements being engineered out of their lives when we're taking escalators and elevators yeah. and cars and yeah. now we've got you know scooters that we don't have to actually push they can just go, yeah. go themselves um yeah. and so for those folks even as something as simple as you know squat into a chair and back up, you know, as we, Mm -hmm. as you get older and we start to lose some of these things that we take for granted, that can be a big early sign candidate of of some adverse things that are about to happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's ridiculous that, uh, as you say, it's sort of, we've got this divergence. There are a group of people who are, you know, probably exercising and more intensely than, you know, any groups ever have in history. The, the, the defining difference, though, is, as you point out, is that they probably need to do that because they're daytime jobs like my job. I, I, I sit in front of a computer screen uh, mm-hmm. and if I didn't you know, get up and walk around, which we now know is a pretty good thing. These people, the interrupters that, that you know, go and get a drink, you know, go get a coffee and just even getting up is, is you know, standing up is, is a big deal for these folks. At the same time, you've got this, you know, highly sedentary population who I think then uh, the food environment just, uh, you know, just allows expression of all of these sort of poor things. Uh, you know, the, the bottom line to me with a lot of this stuff is to really um, try and focus on both things. I mean, I think this daily habitual physical activity and uh, 10,000 steps or whatever you want to call it are things that it's sort of, you know, walking is, it's ridiculously effective at, at, you know, reducing risk for all kinds of things. So, you know, you probably don't need to do these extreme forms of exercise if you're doing and habitually so these 10,000 steps or probably, you know, rewind 50 years, we were much more manual labor oriented and so many tasks that have now been replaced by, by machines. Um, so it's, it's the stereotype is, you know, the farmer who lives to be, you know, 90 something or whatever, but you know, if you've ever, I don't know if it, it's not too many, there's less and less people that have worked on a farm, like, and not, I mean, true farm work, it's a killer. It's super hard. You know, if you ever, if you ever bailed hay or, you know, uh, 
husk corn or get you know, like it's it's ridiculous. Like at the end of the day, you're you know you're exhausted, and so doing that day in and day out, that's that's just somebody who you know the the physical labor that they did was was probably what kept them alive for so long. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. Growing up, our neighbor across the way who lived out in the country was a guy named Frank, and he lived until his eighties, and he was fit yeah. and strong, and then one day, you know, succumbed, but he was you know, fully functional and, and, and yeah. strong up until the end. But uh, if we shift gears now to talk on the athletic side of things, I mean, we touched on protein previously. I know performance staffs and athletes and, and aspiring athletes are always trying to, again, find these sort of marginal gains. And obviously you've done a lot of work in this area and two that come up in relation to, to Lucy, which we talked about um, is HMB, hydroxymethylbutyrate and its role, potentially more so in limiting muscle breakdown. But uh, starting there would be would be great. You know, we obviously see studies yeah. more so in older populations. Uh, so I'm not sure. You know, to get everyone up to speed, can you give us a definition for HMB and then share your insights? Sure. Leucine is an amino acid. As, a, as I said, it's sort of a key amino acid. So it triggers muscle protein synthesis. It also puts a lid on muscle protein breakdown, and so it has these sort of you know metabolic. I'll call them cousins, brothers, sisters, whatever you want to call it. But so there's a, a keto acid form, alpha keto isocoproic acid, that is basically leucine without the nitrogen. Uh, beta HMB or beta hydroxy beta methyl butyrate is uh, a, another deaminated, so no nitrogen, but yet structurally similar compound to leucine. Um, you know, our, our take on that, or at least my take on it, is that. Um, Anything that resembles leucine from a structural perspective is going to mimic it pretty close from a physiological perspective. And so it's always difficult for me to believe that there's something out there that is so much better than what leucine is. I mean, this, that's, it's, a, it's a pharmacology principle, right? If yeah. something is physiologically pushing on a receptor, uh, then you can create a pharma compound which could push on the receptor either you know, harder, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it's, it's what we call its binding coefficient is tighter, where it pushes on it for longer or something like that. So, yeah. uh, and, you know, alpha KIC or beta HMB and everything, uh, to me are, are pretty redundant in their effects with, with leucine. So if you have protein dialed in, and so this is the, you know, sort of 1.6, 2.2, uh, I don't think HMB is going to squeeze more out of the cloth. Now, if you're an older person and you know you're sick for whatever reason, then things are a little bit different. It's harder to to get leucine to work. Uh, beta HMB may have some effects in those scenarios, and most of the evidence that I would call you know better evidence for its effects are in in populations who are who are sick. And even there, uh, I'm a little bit I, I sort of squint a little bit because. Uh, the evidence is a little bit more heterogeneous than than I think uh, most people would um, would think for sure. So, let's just say it's uh, it could have some effects, but I think that for the elites, they're largely redundant with with leucine. Yeah, once athletes are hitting that protein total and dividing it through the day, then yeah, you're really not. Uh, it comes back to that metabolic or anabolic resistance that you talked about in those older populations and providing a bit mm -hmm. of potentially extra benefit. Now, would that be? still obviously better benefit with just using leucine versus HMB in an older population? Like, would you bother using HMB or would it be an addition potentially? Yeah. yeah I mean, good, good question. Uh, I, I think, in, you know, again, when you look out there and you've got these leucine enriched formulas, which have been trialed by a number of companies now, uh, I, I don't think that if, even if you put HMB head to head that you would expect much of a difference between yeah. groups. So most of the studies where HMB has been tested are HMB versus, you know, nothing carbohydrate. And, you know, so it's something versus nothing. And I understand that that's the appropriate placebo. Yeah. It tends to show an effect the, what, what's referred to as non-inferiority. So if you put leucine and HMB head to head, the question is, is one better than the other? Um, we've done that in, uh, in young men in a very uh, heavy resistance training program and saw nothing. I would think in older people, it would be the same result, but you know, nobody's keen on doing that trial, least of all the people yeah, that own the patent or, on uh, HMB and, you know, have it in their formulations. So yeah. uh, let's just say that um, I, I'm still, I wouldn't bet money on that HMB is so much better than uh, protein or leucine. Gotcha. 
And another one that comes up is phosphatidic acid. So proposed to have that direct stimulation on the mTOR pathway. Again, yeah. you know, you, you and your group have done a recent review on this. Might it act as an anabolic aid or what do you see there? Again, so, you know, the, the ethos of coming from McMaster where, you know, we like to claim that we invented evidence-based medicine or evidence-based science, call it whatever you is, is to, you know, instead of relying on one study is to step back, do a systematic review, look at all the studies and then look at the totality of the evidence. I think it's it's pretty mixed on, on phosphatidic acid. So you, there are some studies uh, that show an effect. There are plenty of others that, that don't, uh, but it's a really small pool of data that makes me think that, again, it's one of these sort of, you know, it's a marginal uh, twist at the end or the you know, the, the sprinkle on top or the, yeah. you know, something like that. So it works great in, uh, in cells in a dish. Uh, it looks great with uh, animal data. Uh, and again, here's another one where we take it up to the human level and things get really gray. And, and that's, you know, that's, a, that's an ongoing theme. We're, we're yeah. complicated. Yeah. We're not like, you know, lab animals. We're not cells in a dish. <laughs> we're uh, complex, you know, really highly structured organisms. And so it's, it's, it never surprises me when something sort of gets lost on the way or the effect, you know, it was massive to start with. Yeah. And then, oh, here it is in rats or mice. And then, and then in humans, it goes right into the gray. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, that, that's, a, that's a story that's very common with, say, drugs for, you know, Alzheimer's treatment. Tons of promising drugs in rodent models of Alzheimer's. Clinical trials in humans, we've got maybe one maybe two, yeah. uh, nothing that is this sort of epiphany breakthrough drug, which, which is a shame for, you know, some of these diseases for sure. Yeah. And it's interesting on the athletic side, it always, as a clinician practitioner comes down to like the, the budget we're spending on some of these supplements. And then it's like, well, could we put some of that towards the food that we want to eat? Cause oftentimes that's the messaging we're getting is, Hey, that's expensive. And you say, <laughs> well, wait a minute, we're spending 200 bucks a month on supplements. Why don't we, you know, and when you create a list for athletes to show them how much protein you can get for an extra hundred or two hundred dollars a month it's pretty uh it's pretty impressive um yeah i have a, a colleague a friend and i'll paraphrase his name is ron mon and he's been around the sports nutrition supplement world forever um and so it's this is sort of the paraphrase phillips version of yeah. ron mon's three rules of supplements says if it sounds too good to be true it probably is if it is too good to be true it's probably banned. Yeah. And, you know, rider three is there may be some exceptions, but it's a short list. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, the shifting gears to talk about, this is sort of the novel protein supplements. A good friend of mine, Tyler Churchward Venn, who obviously worked with you guys at McMaster yeah. and yeah. doing some great work at McGill, is doing some work on cricket protein now. We see potato mm. protein. So in this whole yeah. new space of viable alternatives, you know, what's, yeah. what does that research uh, space look like at the moment? It's interesting. Uh, it, you know, I, I'll say this is that if you asked me this question, you know, 20 years ago, I'd have just lied a lot that you like cricket protein, come on, yeah. you know, and then yeah, 10 years ago, I'm like, oh, you hear more about this. And I'm still, you know, so it's it, like a lot of things, you, you, you've got to get it in your hands and convince yourself that it works, right? Yeah. Um, potato protein, and everybody goes, oh, how much protein are in potatoes? And the answer is not very much, but we grow, you know, 10 trillion tons of potatoes and we don't eat them all uh so processing them and getting some uh, some protein back is actually a pretty viable way and it's not bad protein like it's pretty high quality protein so i think it's you know if you eat enough of it it's it's probably redundant with whey or casein and everything else not surprisingly however always a challenge with plant-based isolate proteins they just have flavors that um, make you go hmm it's not the best tasting but you know, food science marches on and makes it makes it taste great. I grew up eating Joe Weider protein powder, and and it tasted awful. It's big you know? So, and yeah, and now it's like it's like you know cookies and cream, and I'm like this stuff. Where was this stuff when I was younger? Yeah. Uh, cricket protein. I had some sent to me by a company out of Mexico, and you know, a lot of people are like, no, nope, that just never trying it. You know, the whole idea and everything just put you off. So I thought, you know, how bad can it be? And, and it was actually dark chocolate and, and cinnamon. So, you know, go figure that yeah. in Latin America, they've got chocolate figured out. And, and it was, it tasted great. Like it really was. And you look at the profile and it's not bad. So, 
you know, we're, we're going to have to feed nine point whatever billion people in the next few years. And so protein is going to be the, the limiting food macro, uh, you know, starch, easy, oils, easy, no problem. Protein it, is going to be tough to find. So where are we going to get it? Uh, because we can't raise enough animal protein to feed everybody. It's going to have to come from plants or alternative sources. So look for more in this space. It's, it's definitely on the rise. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and that amino acid profile then, is that looking, you know, in terms of leucine content and some of these things that you like to see, is it, is it getting closer to what you'd like to see in a protein yeah. alternative? Well, it's not as good. Let's, let's be honest. And I think a fundamental truism is that plant-based proteins are lower quality uh, than animal-based proteins. But when you isolate the protein, and so you take out all of the anti-nutritional fiber, phytate, and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. uh, compounds from plants or you know, insects or something like that, then it comes on to the amino acid score. And, you know, the, the way to compensate is you just eat a little bit more of it. Um, yeah. But corn protein is a fermented, you know, fungal protein. And so now people are going to these types of sources using fermentive processes to make proteins in a giant sort of fermentive chamber uh, and you're going to see more and more and more of that. Like it's pretty clever, a lot of it. Yeah. Um, so just just stay tuned. It's an exciting another exciting time for protein out there. It seems even more, you know, what you described seems even better to me than some of the plant based burgers, which I know are getting better. But in terms of the level of processing and everything else that goes into kind of making a patty versus yeah. just a powder, it seems more straightforward on the powder front to get the nutrition you're after and the taste versus having to add all the other factors in there. What's your take on that? Yeah, I, it's, you know, it's interesting. It, it's obviously a choice. I mean, you know, mycoprotein like corn, for example, they just, they've just grown it and they don't do anything to process or take the protein away from everything else that's in there. So it's, it's full of carbohydrate and fiber and everything else like that. And, and you know, people are like, well, it lowers quality and, and it would, let's face it, but its taste profile is actually not bad. It's fairly neutral. And so you can flavor it with all kinds of things. Other people are fermented proteins and they extract the protein out. I, you know, I've heard some examples and talked to some people about, you know, particular kinds of bacterial fermenters, because this is the peculiarity of, of this, of the type of bacteria produce, you know, things that we, you know, we're in need of like, you know, rich B vitamin mm -hmm. uh, production, for example, vitamin K, uh, which we can't produce, but our gut microbiome can. Uh, and the only source of it we get is usually from green leafy vegetables, which we don't eat a lot of. Yeah, um, but, enough. you know, so a bacterial species that's producing protein that also produces vitamin K could come up and end up being, you know, uh, a rich source of a, a nutrient that is only available from, from plants. So, you know, th there are lots of reasons to think that this is a, is a pretty viable way of, um, you know, producing protein and, on mass that we're going to see more and more of. Yeah. Like you said, it's exciting to be able to see all these different alternatives coming up. And if we can start to even solve the, the food waste side of the equation, because I know that's just uh, yeah. epic well, in terms of the amount that we throw away, you know, we can yeah. hopefully make a dent in that. Yeah. That's, that's a huge issue. And I don't think people really understand that, but again, I was on a webinar with a company that is all about what they call upcycling. And so taking uh, food waste, and when we talk about food, I'm not talking about garbage, but, you know, food that wastes on the shelves of grocery stores and they just toss out that goes to, a, you know, usually a fermentive landfill site or something for compost, uh, that reclaiming nutrients from some of that, that food um, is, yeah, yeah you, you're really hitting on something that's pretty important for sure. Absolutely. And if we uh, shift gears to talk the training side now in terms of athletes, you know, Athletes are busy as well, especially when we talk team sports at the highest mm. level. Strength coaches will always tell you they don't have as much time as they want with any of their athletes until it's the off season. Sure. And even then it's compressed. And so trying to figure out these sort of whether it's minimum effective doses or being efficient with their time. And, you know, you recently contributed to the position stand, their resistance training recommendations to maximize uh, muscle hypertrophy and athletic population. Yeah. So if we talk about a few different parameters, you know, load being the first one. Can we achieve hypertrophy across a bunch of different zones? I mean, again, going back 10, 20 years ago, we had specific ranges for rep. It 
was an honor to to be part of that position stand that you just mentioned. And uh, you know, I was a small contributor to a, a great team and uh, led by Brad Schoenfeld. So, mm. you know, his work in the area is really instructive in, in, in leading us all uh, to understand a lot of this evidence out there. I think the load question around it used to be, you know, heavy loads were both sufficient, but, and they, and people said necessary for muscle growth. And they gave sort of this, the typical strength endurance continuum paradigm that, you know, the further up the the rep range you got, you just got endurance. And, you know, we know now that that's, that's wrong. Uh, as long as you push the muscle to close to failure or a high degree of effort, however you measure it, one or two repetitions in reserve, like you don't have to go to, you know, the bar doesn't have to be picked off your chest. <laughs> yeah. uh, if you want to do that, that's fine. So no issues, but uh, you know, you can achieve muscle growth at a, at a much wider variety of repetition ranges that we recognize now than I think we would have recognized maybe 10 years ago or, you know, five years, whatever you want to say, but yeah, hypertrophy happens across a much broader repetition range than was once previously thought. It's a re- really interesting finding in, in two different ways because of the, the athletic population at the highest level trying to mitigate injury risk and exposing to some of these really high loads that, you know, the last thing the S&C coach wants to do is get the best player on the team injured. Yeah, yeah, it's a problem. <laughs> yeah, it's a problem, right? Especially if he's making 30, 40 million a year. Um, mm. And then the other end, in terms of that longevity piece, somebody who's 60, 65, 70, we want to create, you know, stimulate some muscle and some hypertrophy. We don't need to actually get to some of these bigger lows, which might again, cause, cause risk for injury, right? Sure. I, you know, I, I mean, I think the point is um, it's been, it's been an interesting journey with that paradigm. Uh, and it's not, it wasn't our work that, that by any means uh, changed the paradigm. So all we did was ask the question and yeah. there's a progression of papers from the spans, three separate PhD students that I supervised to kind of arrive at the point where I think we generated the evidence that convinced me and a lot of other people out there that we were onto something. And, but then you look around and there's plenty of other people that have done this work. So it's, again, it's not just ours. It's comes from lots of other labs. And I think the, you know, the lesson in a lot of this is that the, it, it was truly a dogmatic belief around, you know, you go back to the, like if Thomas DeLorme in 1945, four or five who was rehabbing soldiers that came back from world war two uh, said, you know, heavy weights are both sufficient for growth and necessary. And we just never really budged from that. And uh, you know, so sometimes you got to challenge the paradigm uh, and I'm not saying that we rewrote textbooks, but we, we just expanded people's definition maybe a little bit or, or helped expand people. It wasn't us you know, mm-hmm. that drove it. But it's been interesting to have gone through that and then received emails from a few, you know, very grateful individuals reaching out, you know, guys and, and women in their 50s and 60s saying, thank you so much, because, you know, it used to hurt when I lift this heavy weight or, you know, I couldn't I, like so I, I thought I was going to have to give up something I really enjoyed uh, because why bother lifting lighter weights? But your work has kind of And some of those you go, that's pretty cool. You know, and maybe, you know, for every one person that writes, there are five or six people out there that don't write. So, and I'm thinking, you know, we've got 50 emails. So there's at least 250 people right now that maybe are, you know, so. A hundred percent. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. And what about on the volume and frequency front? Because again, on the athlete side of things, busy schedules, kind of looking at yeah. the minimum effective dose and then even the frequency, because we get some athletes that get really concerned that if they're not lifting enough, you know, over the weeks, then then they're going to all of a sudden be struggling to maintain progress. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. You know, I think the variable that sort of keeps like the, from all of these permutations and combinations, and they're a sort of infinite number mm-hmm. uh, when you think sets, reps, loads, you know, frequency, everything else uh, is volume. Um, once you sort of boil everything down. So, the weight times the sets times the rep, reps per set times the sets times the frequency and everything. Once you equate the volume of, of two different types of workouts, it, they come out fairly similar in terms at least of the hypertrophy that you would get. This principle of specificity still applies. So, you know, if you want like flat out max strength, then train for max strength. If yeah. you're a, you know, a power lifter looking to pull, you know, 
five, 600 pounds off the floor. What's the point in, in training, you know, doing 150 for like, it's just, it's, it doesn't make sense. So for strength benefits, which I, you know, I think are for a pretty large extent, uh, neurally mediated. So you, you, you get good at what you practice. So you, you want to be strong, then practice lifting loads that are strong. And I, you know, I don't have to tell you at the elite levels of basketball um, and, you know, football is a great example of the uh, training for the combine. And, you know, uh, there are guys now that push numbers in that combine, the likes of which we haven't seen, but they, they train specifically to do that. And, and, you know, whether that translates into them being a great player, well, you know, it certainly gets that there's a bar, right? Yeah. Uh, but, you, you know, like the 225 repetitions to failure now, that used to be such a marker. Now guys are, you know, it's 30, 50 repetitions, 50, yeah. right? And you go, is that strength? And surely you, we can all agree that's endurance, right? Mm. It's strength endurance, but it's endurance, right? So it's an interesting time for uh, both elite sports and, you know, mere mortals again out there. Yeah, impressive to see the 4.2s in the 40s this year. that specificity and so with offensive defensive linemen we still need to be powerful and strong and lift heavy things one of the things we get with that group as well is this idea of well if i condition too much i'm going to start to interfere with my gains and so this is a little bit of back and forth in terms of how do we keep these guys metabolically healthy to support even recovery and things like that particularly in the off season but then from a mindset standpoint not have them think that they're going to be diminishing their progress in the gym so is that interference effect you know, how significant is it or or does it really exist at that level? I think, you know, the point I make to athletes is to talk about, you know, the workout is great. Uh, All the good stuff happens in recovery. So you can, you know, over train or under recover, call it whatever you want. And so if you're not, you know, able to get the, you know, the idea is the, the stimulus knocks you down and we're recovering to be better than we were before, but if you can't recover appropriately, if you're not quite getting back, then clearly, you know, you're doing too much and it's probably going to interfere with something that's going on. And this is where it's an art as much as it is a science about, you know, reading your athlete and and your athlete being honest about, you know, how they feel. And then sort of, in some cases, even trying to break your athlete of certain tendencies to want to do more. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm sure you've seen it. We talk about athletes and, you know, when I, when I coached and it was mostly you know, at the varsity level, but rugby players, ice hockey, football, that sort of thing. Um, we talked about athletes who were tough above the neck. You just say, you know, we need you to do this and then we need you to do more. And they'd be like, yep, bring it on. Mediocre physiology, you know, they, they would try everything and they would, they, they would great people to have on your team. Then other people that were just genetically, physiologically gifted, but, you know, they were like, I, I can't do that. I can't handle that. You know, it's, and it's when the two come together that you're like, Hey, this is a, this is a leak, right? Yeah. Um, the longevity issue for, you know, players, uh, the, the O and the D line guys, um, more of the O line guys, uh, you know, they don't live long as a group. Uh, they're, they're metabolically healthy while they're playing and practicing because they're playing them practicing if you're 300 plus pounds and you know I, you can be six four six five I don't care but if you're that big and you retire and you're not now doing all of the exercise that probably kept all of the bad stuff of being that big at bay then yeah there's a serious downside to being that type of size so and not to mention you know bashing your head into somebody else's yeah. head if we're talking you know uh, football, it's tough to watch some of those guys uh, when they when they get a little bit older. Yeah, I mean, it is pretty impressive when you sort of a joke you, you can't outrun a bad diet when you see some of these guys because the <laughs> amount of musculature and what they do, like you said, you look at their profiles in season and it's these guys look as good as anybody else. But like yeah, you mentioned, you, you can outrun it for a while. Yeah. <laughs> you see the point. Yeah. It, at some point, it's going to catch up with you. And 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 I think it all depends. There have been plenty of athletes who I've seen who retire. And then have to, it's almost like relearning how to be fit and train for your health as opposed to for some, you know, prime elite level 
statistic or whatever it was. And so, yeah, you now now you're now you're one of us. Step back into the rank and file and train to be in shape and to do the things that you want to do. It's it's tough. Yeah, it's, I had Jake May on a couple episodes ago just talking about the importance of actually losing that weight when they come off that because that metabolically healthy obesity phenotype just doesn't really hold unless we get that weight loss of so shifting the diet. And you do see it these days with a lot of guys, whether it's you know Joe Thomas and the likes that are yep. shedding a lot of weight uh, post-retirement, which is great. But you see the new size of the offensive linemen, and they're even bigger than even – five or six years ago. So it's definitely something. I think that the standard practice in a lot of schools, particularly NCAA Div 1 schools is, you know, these guys come out of high school and they might be 260, 270 pounds and they, they're automatically redshirted in their freshman year so that we can, we can, you know, we we need them over 300. And I'm like, like, when did that become, you know, I remember uh, when I was a kid, you know, trading in uh, uh, football trading cards and and Dan Deardorff was a 300 pounder, but he was the only one. Now that's like the entry level weight. And, and so it's, uh, you know, it's a long time to carry, carry around a lot of weight on your, on your frame, no matter how big and strong you are. So uh, you can understand the need when these guys step away from the sport to kind of get back to normal-ish. They'll always be yeah, big, no question. Sure. So uh, tough to do. Yeah, it's amazing when, uh, when William, the, the fridge Perry was uh the yes. biggest guy in the NFL, and now he'd be a little yeah. guy in, in the, today's modern league. But uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Qu- a quick one for you here around training. I mean, I recently was listening to Dr. Andrew Huberman's podcast with, with Duncan mm-hmm. French and talking a lot about testosterone and looking at how to support testosterone outputs with different training yep. protocols. And so, on this topic, there's a lot of noise around that. And, you know, that episode in particular, that exchange, I know Duncan was sort of trying to talk around that a little bit in terms of this idea of trying to maximize your testosterone output and therefore to amplify your hypertrophy gains. Can you speak to to that? Yeah. You know, I I think it's fair to say like right off the bat, this is a something that Duncan and I disagree on. Uh, And he and I have, we've had conversations about this and he points to lots of evidence that in, you know, to him at least is convincing. I'm not as convinced. Uh, We don't think that the sort of change, like if you can chronically shift testosterone and I'm talking for, you know, years, Uh, then I could see an advantage. Uh, Duncan is the elite sports strength guy in the MMA. So, you know, if you're a fight sport combat athlete, then, you know, there's roles for testosterone in that sport that extend beyond muscle and strength to do with aggression, mindset, all kinds of other things. So let me just say is that there's um, plenty of evidence to suggest if you can manipulate testosterone chronically and long-term and keep it high. So if, yes, if you take steroids, they work. It's like, there's no debate about that. Uh, Manipulating it through different training programs and then using testosterone as some proxy outcome for efficacy of the program. uh, I think there's zero evidence for that. And, you know, again, this is a paradigm that we've pushed around in lots and lots of different ways, and we've yet to see an outcome the retort becomes you're not dealing with the elites of the elite. And my point is, is even if we got those people, the, the range of testosterones between the person at the top and the person who's 100th on the list would probably show, although nobody's willing to uh, leak the data, uh, no relationship at all. And the true fly in the ointment and all of this stuff that makes me think, you know, the whole paradigm is actually a bunch of garbage is, women have tenfold less testosterone. And yet I look around the MMA at the women that fight. And, you know, so the, the, the bad part for bigger women is there's a cap on the, on the top, right? So some of these women out there, they have as much muscle and are strong, uh, maybe not pound for pound, but relative to their size as men. And yet they, they have no chronic changes in testosterone, but there are women that dominate weight class divisions and, you know, the testosterone, I'm sure, is nothing near what men have. So yeah. is it really the situation that that's the driving force behind all of this? Uh, I just don't see it, to be honest with you. Tremendous, Prof. Listen, I appreciate the time coming out for us today. So last last couple of questions for you. Yeah, go for One it. of those, uh, your routine. What, what does your routine look like on the training front? We <laughs> circle back to the start of this conversation around <laughs> longevity. What are you doing from yeah. a training standpoint? And is there a number that you're hitting on your in terms of protein intake that you aim for per day? Yeah. So I, I would say, you know, on a day-to-day basis. Um, I, so 
like people talk about, you know, that you need to fill out a diet record and it's just sort of been so ingrained. And every time I eat something, I'm like five, 10, I'm like 20. I, I know how much pro- I'm, I'm not as clear on the carbs because it's not what I do, but I eat carbs. I eat lots of protein, relatively speaking, I'm probably close to about 1.5, 1.6 on a day in day out basis, just even without thinking pretty rare for me to do supplements. I, I will usually at breakfast. That's the, that if there's a time, then that's when I take them. But my go-to food at breakfast has become, you know, Greek style yogurt. So a little bit more protein than the regular yogurt mm-hmm. and uh, yogurts, you know, it's a superfood and all this there sort of go. stuff, but I try and do it as much through food. Uh, I pay a lot more attention about what it is that I'm eating. I don't drink near as much as I did when I was younger. I'm a real amateur, low tolerance when it comes. So it's, it's maybe a glass of wine is, is, is sort of my, my outside or, or beer or something like that. Yeah. Uh, workout wise, uh, I try and do something every day. I only really push myself five days a week. The, the weekends are really gotten into, you know, some hiking and sort of, you know, back trails and, and, and that type of stuff with some good friends. So it's, uh, a good social activity and uh, quality time. And, you know, we get a little workout in and work up an appetite, which is how we usually finish off. So for two years, I didn't go to the gym and, you know, I'm in my basement now and this is my home gym. And so I've been pretty innovative around trying to use lighter weights, bands, that sort of thing. And uh, I haven't really lost much of certainly from a, a muscle mass standpoint. And again, I have tool, I have like a, suite of tools that I'm able to say. Go, yeah, I'm still here. Access to a few uh, things that most people don't have. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not that not not that most people uh, would have access to. So from that perspective, things are good. I, I I'm definitely not as strong as I as I was 20 years ago. Although it's hard to admit I'm I'm on the downslope. So I'm trying to just change the change how, how steep that yeah. slope is. Um but I think it's it's like a lot of things. So I've been I'm a little kinder to myself about, um, you know, a workout that doesn't maybe meet the threshold for, you know, knock down, drag them out. I'm like, no, there's always tomorrow. So the event horizon for me now is uh, a lot of years down the road. It used to be so I could keep up with my sons, but uh, two out of the three of them now, even if I got in tight, uh, they they could take me. (laughs) Number three is still a little smaller. I could take him on, but uh no, nah, man, it's it, those days are done. So, and, and pretty soon it, it, they'll just obviously be like, Hey boys, don't, don't knock the old man. Around. Okay, so. <laughs> and how about the recovery front Prof, in terms of, you know, you mentioned kind of even the alcohol, I mean, that's definitely something for me as well. It's like lowering that helps in the recovery front. anything else that you found that helps Absolutely. the joints feel happy and can allow you to, to train like you'd like to. Yeah. You know, so honestly, I'm convinced that your soft tissue, your muscles are, they remain sort of pliable, malleable, call them whatever you want, plastic, you know, they can adapt even into your eighties and nineties. Uh, the tissue that has a hard time recovering is, is joint tissue. So anything that's call it, you know, collagenous. So ligaments, tendons, even your bone, which is, you know, it's about 40% uh, by composition protein. And I know a lot of people that go, protein. And I'm like, yeah, it's not just a stick of chalk, right? It would, it would break all the time. If it were, I wish there were something out there that that could really uh, find some relief. I've got two knees, which are pretty crappy from doing too much stuff when I was younger and rugby, ice hockey, football, you name it. And I've tried glucosamine. I've tried chondroitin. I've tried the two together. I've tried all kinds of things. I've, I've done the collagen route and, you know, Keith Barr, chirping in my ear one hour before yeah. vitamin C. And I'm like, I'm doing oh, all I that. Stuff. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, I'm, I'm doing it and I don't find much relief to be really honest with you. Um, I've started doing a lot more stretching and foam rolling. And I know everybody goes foam rolling and I'm like, you're right. I don't see the evidence, but it feels good. <laughs> You know, yeah. and so I, I just feel better. But I, I also said, like, I, I give myself permission if I'm, if you know, my hips, knees, shoulders, elbows are sore, I go lighter, or I'm like, you know, forget it. I go for a walk and live to fight another day. That's the. I, I don't need to do the things that I did when I was younger. I still do some stupid things. And my wife will be the first to remind me of that. I'll, I'll try and do something that I know is sort of pushing it. And every time I do the the next day, it's like a reminder, like you just went past where you, you you know, you can't do do that. that. (laughs) Yeah. And, 
And then you can't train for, you know, however many days. And that's, that's the, you know, the rub. Uh, so for me, I'm just trying to maintain something that's regular and keep myself as fit and strong as I can. And, uh, you know, from there, it's okay to skip a day. Uh, and I know, obviously, nobody skips and insert, you know, leg day or whatever, but yeah. I do enough leg days. So it's, all, it, it, it's all good. Awesome. Yeah, it's great. I mean, uh, those lighter days can definitely help with the joints and everything else. It's nice to know that we train a little bit smarter as we get older versus uh, trying to slam, slam it every day. It's hard, but it, you're right. The, the key word is smarter and just about, you know, not one challenge either your ego or the guy beside you who happens to be, you know, 25. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, I could do that. And then inside there's the other person going, no, you can't. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> Awesome, Prof. Really appreciate you coming out some time today and uh, sharing your My insights pleasure. with us. You know, where's the best place for people to keep up with all your research and fantastic work? Yeah, I, I'm on Twitter as MacKinProf, M-A-C-K-I-N-P-R-O-F. I'm on Instagram with the same handle. Uh, it's beginning to figure Instagram out. I've got a few things that when I have a little bit of time, I'll, I'll hopefully make a, a, a bigger footprint on there. Uh, Facebook as well, Stuart Phillips, PhD. You can find me just about everywhere. Um, email is a tough one. Everybody's, I sent you an email and I'm like, like I field about 90 emails a day. So yeah. sorry if you're a slip through the cracks, but I, I try and get back to people on social media. Really appreciate the interactions. And, uh, you know, it's a great forum to try and translate some of the, the work that we do. Tremendous. We'll, we'll include all those links in the show notes. And uh, again, yeah, awesome. I really always appreciate your time and insights. My pleasure, Mark. Thanks for having me on the show, man. 